Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Gilded Age in the United States, a time period that Mark Twain coined. And the idea of the Gilded Age, the term gilded means that you've got some cheap metal with a thin covering of gold over it. If you look at that object, it looks, you know, like it's gold and it must be worth a lot of money and it's very precious and very special. But then you scratch it a little bit and that gold, you realize it's not actually all the way there. It's just a hunk of something cheap. It's just a little bit of tin with a little bit of gold on top. That's what he coined this part of America as. The idea of it was it looks nice on the outside, scratch it a little bit and you've got a problem. There's a lot of stuff that goes into the Gilded Age. The first big thing we're going to take a look at is the new age of industry that came into existence. Now, the United States jumps into the Industrial Revolution for the second half, a uh, late 19th century. And it's not until about 1880 do we see that more people are engaged in non-farming work. They're engaged in factory work. The concept of industry is that the machine does the labor for us instead of you know us doing it and it can free up society to do other things instead of just farming the industrial world we have now is why i can have two-day amazon shipping it's why i don't need to farm it's why i can engage in things i want to and prior to this point even education and college like this didn't exist as we can see as America continued to industrialize, we see that some regions are going to be more concentrated centers of specific industry. Pittsburgh is for steel, Chicago for telecommunications, the Great Lakes for oil. And this is one of those go moments for the United States. So much so that by the dawn of World War I, we are producing one third of industrial stuff for the whole world, just the United States. And there were a lot of things that allowed this to happen. There's a lot of raw materials in the United States that can be processed into other stuff very easily. There's the fact that we have two oceans on either side of us and no major industrial nation rivaling us nearby. Very quickly, we see how much money could be made from manufacturing stuff. In 1859, at just before the Civil War, the United States is producing about $1.8 billion of manufactured stuff every year. By the end of the 19th century, that number has increased by almost a factor of 10. We could produce on scale with the other superpowers of the world. And we were the burgeoning superpower. Unfortunately, there were people who wanted to get rich quick, make money fast, and they didn't care how they did this. This led to some very corrupt business practices. Lots of people are going to migrate from Western Europe to here, from East Asia to the United States, because they're looking for the American dream. And that was a dream that was believed to be attainable here. The first big industry to address is the railroads. Now, when we think railroads today, they are nothing like what I mean in the late 19th century. By the end of the Civil War in this country, there's about 35,000 miles of railroad track. By the end of the 19th century, that factor has increased by almost by seven. From the last decade of the 19th century, there's a billion dollars in passengers, in freight, in stuff, just on the rail lines. 
the government gave railroad companies large amounts of land and the plan of it was that if you're building a railroad the federal government gave you in some cases a mile on either side of the track you're building you get that land a mile in either direction and the reason for this was to make sure that the train could still go that there wasn't like you know rock slides or a forest or a swamp land that land belonged to the railroad company and it's kind of crazy to think that much land that much area and that much money moving this quickly this is the time before ups can drop something off at my door from a two-day prime delivery the only way that stuff is getting here is from the rail the only way i'm getting stuff is by jumping on a train and this map shows how quickly things grew and you can see from in 1950 and onwards how quickly it also fell apart and the reason it starts to fall apart after the 20th century or the later part of the 20th century is because of the car now when you look at these maps specifically from 1860 to 1890 you're going to notice that the eastern half of the united states is filling in very very quickly heck even if you look at the 1951 there is a significant concentration of railroads on the eastern half versus the western half now part of that is because the farther west you go you're going to hit you know you hit a couple of mountain regions you hit a couple of deserts but larger than that you've got the american frontier people who are arriving from europe are arriving on the east coast and a lot of them are staying there Railroad companies had all this land, but they didn't have people moving there too. So we see that create bureaus of immigration. And the goal of the bureaus of immigration was to get people to the West, to get people to buy land there, to get people to stay there. All that land the federal government gave to these railroad companies, the railroad companies have and have to do something with. So they sell it. And this makes them significantly more profitable. Our first real tycoon of the railroads was this man, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now he started in shipping on boats for the first half of his life and it wasn't until the second half of his life did he work to railroad travel railroad trade railroad connections he built the companies he built the lines he built the businesses and he would go on to control giant chunks of the railroad industry he was responsible for building Grand Central Station in New York, and that was the turning stone for the railroad industry. You have so many immigrants arriving in New York, and oh look, here's a train station that can take you anywhere. Wow, I'm going to jump on that because it's right here, and so am I. He did that. One guy. And when a group of other train companies wanted to use his lines and he said you're gonna to have to pay for it they said no we're on a train what are you gonna do he shut them out he controlled for a while all the comings and going of rail travel rail shipping rail everything out of new york and yowza it's hard to imagine one person in control of all of that but there was and that was him as railroads became more and more consistent, we see they're going to also have more and more technological oomph to them. Uh, we see in 1864, George Pullman invents the sleeping car. And the idea of a sleeping car is, well, prior to this point, if you wanted to buy a train ticket, you would buy a train ticket and you'd buy a seat. And that seat is a chair. Sometimes it's got a cushion on it. Sometimes it doesn't. That's just bolted to the floor and that's your seat for the ride you can get up you can move around go have some food play games but that is your seat if you get tired you're gonna sleep in that chair 
and we've all had to sleep sitting up. That's not problematic. But when you might be on a train for a couple of days, that can make life a little less comfortable. Pullman sleeping cars were small were train cars that were divided into smaller compartments that had beds in them and you could buy the bed to sleep on kind of like a bunk bed that again is bolted to the floor this was considered a great luxury especially if you're going to be traveling for a couple of days but five years later george westinghouse invents the air brake and this is a new type of braking system Instead of using friction to stop the train, these air brake systems can stop it much quicker. And if you can stop quicker, you can carry more, you can go faster. It makes the whole transportation process a lot easier. Everywhere the railroad lines are going, telegraph lines are also going. And you can see that in this picture. The idea that is very simple. If you're on the frontier and you want to communicate with somebody back on the East Coast, you need the ability to do so. And this is the telecommunication network that can. The thing about how all this works, specifically railroads, is you need some raw materials. Iron works good, but iron is heavy. It's dense. And Boy, wouldn't it be nice to use something stronger, you know, like steel. And making steel is very difficult because you start with iron, superheat the iron until the iron is in a liquid state, and then you remove the impurities. Those impurities are going to float to the top. Now, the way that it had been done for thousands of years was you just skim the impurities right off the top. But that's very difficult because you're dealing with liquid iron, which is about 1400 degrees. If you do this wrong, you could lose a finger. You could lose an arm. You're doing it in very small batches, in very small uh, kilns, maybe something as big as a pasta pot. It's slow going. And that means that if you want it, and because it's so dangerous, you're going to pay a lot of money for steel. All that changes with the Bessemer process, and that's what this machine that you can see in this picture is. It is a very large furnace that heats the iron up so that it's a liquid, pumps hot air right into the furnace, and all those impurities which are sitting at the top of the liquid iron are going to be blasted out the top of the furnace, turning them immediately into flying bits of metal some of them are you know very very small but it is definitely very dangerous the guy who sees this and brings this to the united states is a man named Ar andrew carnegie now carnegie saw this and thought we can do it here and he creates this giant factory for creating steel in pittsburgh it had been unlike any steel production facility that ever worked and had ever existed. And it worked. It worked great. The Bessemer process that he created there was, it was as big as a factory. And what it did is he could produce steel very, very cheap, very efficiently, and very quickly. All at once, this one man is responsible for controlling cheap steel production in the United States. When it comes to petroleum, we usually think petroleum, oil, oh, we're talking gasoline. Not necessarily. Our first real successful oil, petroleum well was dug in 1859 in Pennsylvania. And it's not producing too much. Processing is about two to three million barrels a year and really caps out in this country. And that's across all petroleum production. So at about 50 million barrels by 1890. And the thing that we are turning this stuff into is kerosene, not gasoline. Kerosene is way more stable, also way less energetic. 
you're less likely to accidentally blow up or set yourself on fire and it's used for lamps and that was the way of it the first big oil monopoly in fact the first true monopoly of its kind was started in 1870 and i'm not a monopoly is where one person or company controls an entire industry so our first oil monopoly was started by john rockefeller within a decade he controlled the ability to refine oil to refine petroleum on its own this stuff is useful petroleum and oil are useful but if you don't refine them into kerosene or gasoline it's just sludge you can't do nearly anything with it since he controlled how to turn the oil into anything else he effectively controlled the market itself and he did this by a lot of different ways he would sell oil cheaper than anybody else and if you couldn't afford to sell it that cheap you might have to sell your business or give up your business and then when you're the only guy in town and he was he could control however much it was if it needed to be expensive it was expensive if oh look there's a startup company let's make it cheap so they can't compete he did that he controlled all of this and he set up several different trusts to ensure that he could maintain this monopoly so that it could keep going a trust is kind of like a monopoly with a lot of micromanagement uh, that's the best way i can put it uh, you might think of your favorite coffee chain uh, starbucks i can go anywhere in the world and find me a starbucks i can go into different com different branches in different parts of the world and different regions of the united states and i might find something a little different but it is still starbucks that's the monopoly for coffee this is the monopoly for oil the telephone game changes in 1876 when alexander graham bell makes his first telephone call within two and a half decades there's almost a million telephones in the united states and telephones were great because your average citizen didn't need a telegraph reporter to translate the code from morse to you know verbal communication there's still telegrams but they're slowly on the way out the industry that's going to control and really make a name for itself is american telephone and telegraph they're going to be responsible for well hell still being a telecommunication infrastructure today thomas edison also known as the wizard of menlo park opened up a research lab in Jersey and the way this worked was you could come work for him and you were paid a very good salary but you didn't necessarily get to claim anything you created anything you invented as yours it was all his and that's where we get all the stuff that came out of Edison's labs the improved electric light the phonograph the motion picture camera and so many more things with the electric light things changed immediately all at once you had the ability for everyone to first off stay up late this is a time where if the sun goes down and it's you know winter and it's six o'clock and the sun's out you're either lighting candles or probably going to bed now you don't have to do that anymore electricity is going to also start replacing steam power because it's everywhere the lines for lighting the lights are also used for keeping the machines going edison did make some enemies on this rise to the top one of them is going to be nikolai tesla and tesla was a man who was a russian immigrant who worked for Edison for a while but what was not able to go as far as he wanted to Tesla went off and started a new company 
with George Westinghouse, the same Westinghouse who created the air brake system. And between Edison and Tesla, these two became rivals in who could do tech the best. And it exploded into the war of currents, the two different types of currents these two worked at. Um, you've got direct current that Edison had and alternating current that Tesla used. Ultimately, Tesla's systems won out. Mark Twain said that there's only two constants in the world, death and taxes. And following the American Civil War, with so many dead so quickly, and so many people wanting to say goodbye to their loved ones, and see them one last time, life insurance companies came into existence. Embalming somebody so they look like they're just sleeping and so that you can look at them in an open casket was a very quickly growing field and an industry that just did not exist in any other way. And over time, the more elaborate a funeral could become, the more you would pay so you could say that last goodbye a certain way until we have the modern idea of what a funeral is. As with controlling monopolies, just like how Rockefeller would make his oil cheaper than everyone else and then control the price when no one else was in the market, railroad companies did the same thing. They would make seats cheaper. They would make it more luxurious to travel from one area to another to stimulate growth. And this led to huge growths and the idea of what you could have. Once you have larger and larger train companies, you're going to see more and more stuff moving by freight. And that air, we get the ability to order anything, the ability to open a magazine or a catalog, and the idea that you could order anything and have it shipped by these giant railroad companies. There were points in the history of America where you could order a house delivered to you by a train that was assembled like, you know, like an Ikea desk, but it was the same basic principle. Americans for the most part had a love hate relationship with what was going on at this point. Um, they didn't like powerful governments and strict laws. They didn't like big corporate enterprise and monopoly but they do like all the good stuff that comes from having these things. There was the fear that monopolies were going to destroy the economic opportunity for the little guy. And if you wanted to start your own business, why even bother? There was nowhere for you to go. But by the same notion, you could have so many new things and your creature comforts were certainly enjoyable. Our final idea about the Gilded Age is twofold, laissez-faire and social Darwinism. Laissez-faire means hands-off. The idea of laissez-faire economics is that the government is not going to get involved in the market. The government is not going to do anything to the economy at all. It's up to each individual business to do it you succeed or fail on your own. There are no bailouts, there is no OSHA, there is just you, the businessman, and the industry. Supply of this, for some people they like this a lot, because if you were already at the top of your field, then hooray, there's nowhere for you to go down to. But if you were not, if you were struggling to get started, you might feel, you know, some help would be nice. Charles Darwin came up with the idea that over time, animals change. They change so that they can survive. And the most fit animal is the one that can adapt the best. Social Darwinism says that you, quote unquote, won 
the game of life. You became rich and powerful and famous and all that good stuff because you were able to adapt to it. And if you failed, if you tried and you failed, if you didn't get where you wanted to be, it was because you did not do enough yourself to get there. And this is one of those ideas that it sounds nice. It's the great story of like Andrew Carnegie. He was a guy who came here as an immigrant from Scotland, started with nothing, became rich, powerful, steel magnate. We like that. But for other people, JP Morgan, for example, born rich, born powerful, never really had to work for it, just here's all the money. Well, that's a whole different kind of thing. Ultimately, these two competing ideas are going to be characteristics of how people looked at this time and walked away with it how they did. So today we took a look at the Gilded Age, the new industries that came about, and what transpired from all this. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.